Hi, and welcome to First Year Microeconomics. In this presentation, we're going to start building our perfectly competitive market model. To do this, we need to first define what question we want to answer, and then devise a set of assumptions to help us build a model to answer that question. Our base question is, where do prices come from? However, to answer that, we need to narrow it a bit, so we're going to focus on one particular product, the apple. So, we're going to be thinking about the price of apples. Our question will be, what determines the price of apples? Notice that this isn't necessarily a simple question. Apples differ. There are all sorts of different types of apples. Red Delicious, Pink Lady, Granny Smith. They taste different, they have different texture. So we're going to need to have a set of assumptions so that we can build a simple model to try and answer the question, what determines the price of apples? Our first assumption is to dismiss the difference between all the different types of apples. What we're interested in is a well-defined, homogeneous product called an apple. If we're going to talk about the price of apples, we have to answer a question first. What price? The price that buyers pay, the price that sellers receive, they're not necessarily the same. So we're going to make a simplifying assumption. We're going to assume that the price a buyer pays for an apple is the same as the price that the seller receives for that same apple. Our third assumption is called our price taking assumption for the buyers. We're going to assume that each buyer will choose how many apples he or she would like to buy given the price of the apple and holding all other factors such as the person's income or their wealth, the prices of other goods such as oranges, bananas and so on, the person's taste, whether they like apples or not, their expectations and everything else. We're going to hold all of that fixed. So we're saying, how many apples would the buyer like to buy, given the price of apples, holding everything else that could be relevant constant? A fourth assumption is just the price-taking assumption for the sellers. So each seller will choose how many apples he or she would like to sell given the price of apples and holding everything else, such as the technology of running an apple shop, the price of inputs, such as workers in the apple shop, expectations, holding all of that other stuff fixed. So our question is, how many apples would an apple seller like to sell given the price of apples, holding everything else that could be relevant, holding all of that stuff fixed? Assumption five, I'm gonna call our dynamic assumption. It has two parts. The first part is that if the number of apples that buyers in total would like to buy at a particular price is greater than the number of apples that sellers in total would like to sell at that price, then the price of apples will rise. So if the amount people want to buy is more than the amount people want to sell at a given price, the price goes up. And similarly, if the amount that people would like to buy at a particular price is less than the amount that people would like to sell at that price, then the price of apples is going to fall. I'm going to make a couple of extra helpful assumptions. These assumptions aren't necessary for our model to work, but they will make life a lot easier, so we're going to be using them right through this course. The first assumption is that if the price that a buyer faces for apples falls, then the buyer will want to buy more apples. So as the price goes down, you buy more. If the price goes up, you buy less. Similarly, if the price that a seller receives for selling apples rises, then the seller will want to sell more apples. So from a seller's perspective, if the price goes up, they sell more. If they would like to sell more, if the price goes down, they don't want to sell as many apples. Okay, now that we've got our assumptions, we could start to build our model to predict the market price of an apple. Our questions are, what is the price? And what does the price depend on? But hang on a second, before we can do that, don't forget that when you've got a set of assumptions, you should check them back against reality. The model that you build will only be as good as your assumptions. If your assumptions aren't any good, don't bother building the model because your model will be useless. Garbage in, garbage out. So let's check our assumptions first. 
The first assumption is that there is a homogeneous good called an apple. Now, as I've already noted, in the real world, apples differ by type, by taste, quality, and so on. But remember that an assumption is a simplification of a real world. We are not trying to describe the real world, but to focus on key features that will help us simplify the world and answer our question. So in that sense, while apples differ, there is a lot less difference between, say, an apple and a beer, or an apple and a banana, or an apple and a book. You get the idea. Further, our question is focusing on the general issue of apple prices. We're not trying to work out whether one apple is more popular than another, or is one apple healthier than another. So in that sense, our homogenous goods assumption that there's one product called an apple is probably pretty reasonable as an abstraction from reality. Our second assumption is the one price assumption. The price the buyer pays is the price the seller receives. That might sort of seem obvious, but it's actually not the case for many goods and services that we buy because of a thing called the goods and services tax or a sales tax. Whenever there's a sales tax, the buyer pays more than the seller gets to put in their pocket. So when we use the assumption of one price, we're saying there is no sales tax. That's a good starting point, but actually later in this course, we'll be analysing the effects of a sales tax, so we'll be actually throwing assumption two away. The third assumption was our price-taking assumption for buyers. Now, for most buyers, this is pretty accurate. When a buyer goes into a shop to buy an apple, the price is advertised on the shelf and the buyer simply accepts that price and chooses how many apples that buyer would like to buy. The buyer may shop around. So, for example, if one shop is charging more for apples than another shop, the buyer is likely to go to that second shop. But the buyer probably isn't going to bargain much over the price and even if the buyer did bargain, the buyer doesn't have much market power. In other words, a threat by the buyer to not buy the apples unless the price is lowered is unlikely to meet with much success. If the buyer says, drop the price or I'm taking my business elsewhere, the seller's pretty likely to say, see you later. So, most buyers are price takers. Seeing the price, they decide how many apples they would like to buy. Assumption four is our price-taking assumption for sellers. Given the price, an apple seller decides how many apples he or she would like to sell. Does this make sense? Well, yes, for some stores. If you're a small apple seller, and you've got lots of apple sellers around you, then you know you can't change the price very much. If you pushed up your price, all your customers would just go elsewhere. But if you're the only apple seller in town, then the customers can't go elsewhere and you'd have some market power. You could push up the price and still sell some apples and make more money. So our price-taking assumption by sellers only holds if we're in a highly competitive market for apples. Generally, that's a situation where we have lots of small stores. How much do I mean by lots? Well, Certainly once you get more than about 10 stores in a locality selling a similar product, they're going to be price takers. Indeed, once you're more than about five, you can probably say the price taking assumption is going to be pretty good. When doesn't it hold? Well, it certainly doesn't hold when you have only one seller, which is sometimes called a monopoly. If you've got only one seller, they're going to be able to determine the price that they charge. They'll be a price setter, not a price taker. Assumption 4 won't hold for that one seller. We're going to look at this case later on in the course when we look at a monopoly. But for now, we're going to look at the situation of price taking, so numerous small sellers. Assumption 5 is our dynamic assumption. If more people want to sell a product than there are buyers, then the price falls. That seems pretty accurate. Think of what happens near the end of winter, as the number of buyers for winter close falls, shops start their sales, and the price also falls. 
or look at what happens to the price of apples at the end of a day at a fruit market. As buyers become less frequent, the sellers drop their price to try and move their stock. What about the other way around? If more people want to buy a good than there are sellers, does the price rise? Well, this also seems pretty sensible. If there are more people wanting to buy than there are sellers at a given price, then we're going to get a queue. If the queue continues, then the sellers are likely to take advantage of the fact that there's excess buyers and try and push up their price. After all, if there's too many buyers and you push up your price, you don't mind if a few of them go elsewhere. So our dynamic assumptions sound pretty reasonable. Next came our helpful assumptions. These came into two parts. The first related to buyers. Our assumption is that if the price that a buyer faces is less than what they expected, they're going to tend to buy more. If it's higher than what they expected, they're going to tend to buy less. And that sort of makes sense. If you're expecting apples to be, say, $3 a kilogram, and you go to the fruit shop and find it's only $2 a kilogram, same quality apples look just as good. Or you might still buy the amount you plan to buy. Or you might say, gee, they're cheap. I'll buy a few more. But it's sort of unusual that you'd go there and say, oh, oh, gosh, apples, they're so cheap. Oh, no, I don't want to buy apples anymore. So it sort of makes sense that if the price is lower, people are going to tend to buy more. If the price is higher, they're going to tend to buy less. The second helpful assumption was our assumption for sellers. If the price drops, sellers will tend to sell less. If the price rises, they will tend to want to sell more. Does this make sense? Well, yes, it may not be quite as fast as for buyers, but let's say you run a fruit and vegetable shop and you notice that you're able to charge a higher price for your apples and everyone else's price is also higher, well, then you're likely to start selling more apples. How would you do this? Well, you're going to have more of your space in your shop devoted towards apples. You might order more apples in because apples are now more profitable for you. The price has gone up compared to what it was before, so you'd like to sell more. Conversely, if the price is lower than what it was before, you're probably going to start putting oranges, bananas, mandarins, other fruit and vegetables in place of apples. You'll reduce the amount of space for apples because apples don't give you as big a margin anymore. So the helpful assumptions tend to make sense overall. So overall, our assumptions stack up pretty well. The least realistic assumption is the price taker assumption for sellers if there are a few apple sellers. And indeed, we'll be replacing this assumption later on in the course. However, if there are five or more sellers of apples, our assumptions are pretty reasonable, and our perfectly competitive model of the apple market should give pretty good predictions. Thanks for listening.